Are we heading for a mental health crisis in the UK? Are people struggling with stress, anxiety, troubles that they didn't even recognise were mental health problems or challenges? According to statistics, 75% of young people are not getting the help that they need. And as a result of COVID, there is an 8% plus jump in the number of people who are struggling with mental health above the expected annual increase. But imagine that there was something that we could do for ourselves, all the people around us, that would take the seemingly uncontrollable and make it more manageable and controllable again. Health Explorer Neil Fellows here from Total Wellness Club. If you want to get healthy and fit and stay healthy and fit and do it in a way that's unique and natural to you, please subscribe and hit the bell to get notified of all of our latest uploads. Today I'm talking to mental hygienist Richard Tyler about the mental health crisis in the UK. So Richard, if someone was suffering with a, a personal mental health crisis, um, what would we um, see them displaying? What kind of behaviour would we see? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question and, uh, and I think it's actually really important for us all to have to have a sense of this and i guess i'm like a broken leg where we where we see it and it's quite visible it's much harder to to spot not just spot the signs of um, mental health being compromised but then to make any sense or people's ease with starting to judge or come up with their own explanation as to what must be going on so i think with, with mental health generally we must we must go on this whole continuum of down one end, we've got very uh, almost visible symptoms and conditions playing out, which uh, don't need huge amounts of awareness for us to spot that something is not quite right, mm -hmm. right through to those that are very buried. I know before we've touched on um, high functioning anxiety, which I talk about a lot, but high functioning anxiety really is, you know, unlike any of our other forms of anxiety response, we often we often think of anxiety and depression and serious mental health conditions depicted in those images on television or in magazines where someone's kind of in a really dark tunnel, sat down with their head on their knees. And you know, mental health often doesn't display like that. No. Um, we've got people that are still bouncing around offices, getting up early, going in, doing brilliant work, having what seems like a very happy family life. Yeah. And that's where high functioning anxiety comes into play that we make a, a, a lot of assumptions that because someone seems quite successful, they get on with stuff, they seem quite bright, they're offering to help and support other people, that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue around that end of the continuum, certainly with the high functioning anxiety, high functioning depression, where actually the person seems really together. But what we don't have any sense of is when we strip away the masks um, uh, and the symbols, the external symbols of success, there is pain and anguish and difficulty and torment. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we need to hold, we need to hold both. Yeah. Just because it's visible mm -hmm. doesn't mean we can invent and assume what's happening. And just because it's invisible doesn't mean that the person's okay. So let's talk about some of the, some of the more visible, the visible signs that mm -hmm. we might, that yeah. we might see. I mean, no two people behave in the same way. So there are always going to be variations. Mental health, poor mental health has to begin somewhere. So unless someone, unless someone is in a major crisis episode where they have a breakdown or a psychotic uh, experience, the telltale signs start small and will build over a period of time. So, so they are there if we notice them. So I think yeah. for those of us that are not even just around people that we think might be struggling, for those of us that happen to be around, a pe around people at all ever, is looking for patterns where something seems just out of the ordinary. Uh, I mean, it's all our unconscious data we get about people that we go, oh, I know how Neil does that, and I know how he does that, and I know he's really loves doing that thing, and I know he's always, and then we start to notice the moments and, and remaining curious about going, hmm, that's interesting that he's not doing X or he's not doing Y. So some of them might be that perhaps the person is, a person is very sociable and likes to go out and likes to do things and is quite proactive. And then suddenly we start to notice it becomes harder to get them to commit to things mm -hmm. or to agree to do things or agree to have phone calls or agree to meet up and go to the theater. So again, just looking for signs that, and we, and we remain very curious and open and intrigued about what might be going on. 
perhaps their um, behavior or energy or mood becomes quite erratic, almost, um, almost manic in quality where there are the extremes. There might be real low point moment uh, responses of um, anger, frustration, something that feels energetically where they feel really heavy. And there might be extremes of absolute joy and silliness and lightness. Mm -hmm. Um, so we see, so perhaps we start to notice that there are significant mood swings that is almost more unpredictable. Perhaps they were quite constant. Now there's this real swing and shift. Yeah. Prolonged periods, perhaps, of irritability and anger. Uh, maybe we notice that over a period of hours or over a period of days, actually their mood seems much heavier, much darker, um, much more irritable, snappy responses. Poor sleep is, is, is symbolic. We might, they might be telling us that they didn't sleep well or they couldn't get to sleep. Or maybe if we live in the same house as them, we notice that they're up at night or they're watching videos late or they're mm -hmm. getting some sleep in the morning or they need to go and have a sleep in the afternoon. Perhaps we spot a change in diet. So maybe they've gone from eating really healthily to eating lots of, uh, putting lots of shit food into their bodies and pizza and chips and Coke. Yeah. Uh, or, or maybe their diet has improved in some way and they, they cut out some of that stuff and they seem but it's about spotting that something doesn't seem quite as in its normal groove without putting any explanation any story <clears throat> attaching any story to it just being um just noticing it there there might be a, a change in consumption of alcohol or drugs they might be drinking more we might notice they're smoking more we might notice that they're doing weed of some kind Maybe they are having difficulty in carrying out the most basic of everyday tasks. It might be a problem with thinking. It might be a problem with staying focused. It might be a problem with recall and remembering how particular things are done. Uh, perhaps an inability to use logic, whereas perhaps before there's been, there's, there has been logic there. Um, sometimes there is a, a shift in nervousness. So we get just this, there's a slight, um, we just see the anxiety that bubbles away and that might come out in almost a suspicion of others, an apprehension about others or doing things, um, a questioning the motivation of other people. Uh, none of these mean that someone is suffering from uh, some kind of mental health condition. They are su they're purely signposts that go, that lead us to consider perhaps everything is not okay. Yeah. If we're looking at a cluster of them and we go, actually, they're not sleeping well. Suddenly they've started eating loads of pizza and drinking Coke in the mornings. They're really short tempered. Then maybe we're going to go, there's something not quite right. There's something out of balance for them. But I think we have to be, and we can talk about this in a moment, but we just have to be really careful of attaching a story to it, mm -hmm. attaching yeah. and of our, our own diagnosis from a distance. Yeah. Um, we're just looking to go, what, doesn't seem that it that it quite fits the mold for what we know about this person yeah i suppose really what you're saying um, if i've heard what you're saying right you've got that kind of like starting off small which sounds like it can be quite fluid um and then maybe becoming more dense and perhaps there's more evidence at that point that somebody's struggling with something but what you finished off there saying in terms of um, the story, I suppose what, one of the, the dangers is that we all attach our own stories to what we see in other people. And sometimes that's not true. Um, so what I'm just wondering is if we're seeing these signs that people are struggling in the way that you describe, what's maybe the best thing that we could do to help someone or how do we approach this with them? Yeah, but I mean, very, it's interesting, the stories. Very often the stories aren't true. Mm. Uh, they're either they're either stories that we've taken from what we've seen them do in the past yeah. or they're stories that we've mined from our own experiences or the crap we read on the news or whatever it is so very often they are not true so we need to hold the potential and some room and some space for going i know nothing i'm just mm. seeing a series of behaviors a, an, a sense of a different energy and i have no clue what that means even for yeah. me as a therapist i think i um, the importance for me to sit down and and be this empty container that goes uh, I I know nothing I can have a punt at some point but yeah. it's a while down the line before we start to have a punt as to what might be going on mm. um so the question you ask around you know what might we do if we think that someone's struggling there's a lot of fear around this mm. um I, I talk to a lot of corporate clients and you hear there's a lot of fear a lot of resistance uh 
a lot of worry about even starting to address and unfold and unravel and begin a conversation because they think in some way they'll make it worse yeah. or they'll, uh, that they'll, they'll increase the trauma or they'll push the person so close to the edge mm -hmm. by, by starting to unearth this or that we ourselves will not be able to cope and bear the burden of what we hear. Yeah. We, we will not be able to carry that for them and, how could we possibly have the skills and the capabilities and the qualities to be able to support them? So, of course, that might happen unconsciously. It might happen in nanoseconds consciously, and therefore the choice is made to ignore it and hope it gets better. Mm. I hope it goes away. Um, we don't generally like facing our own vulnerabilities. And by getting close to someone and starting to get a glimpse of what their world looks and feels like means that we have to face our own um, vulnerability. Yeah. In, 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 in my world, there's a very decent human being response that we are, that the planet is calling out for that would be more reassuring to see, which is that we can dare ourselves to, to believe that we can hold another, that we have enough, that we have enough capacity. You know, the, the ton of research that is around the benefit of the therapeutic relationship, that the majority of what makes a successful therapeutic relationship is the quality of the holding, is the quality of the alliance, is the quality that one person can be with another. Take the modality out of it, take 40 years of experience as a therapist out of it. Of course it matters, but there's a, there's a ton of evidence and data that shows us that the, the real change comes from being able to be with another without, without any judgment, without any blame, without any diagnosis, just to be a container for them. So um, in terms of, if, we just, if we've made a decision to go, I'm going to have this conversation. There's something about making some time without distraction. So this is not a corridor conversation. It's not a conversation that the end of a meeting as someone's about to go into another meeting. It's not um, as someone is about to leave for work in the morning or as they're about to go home. Make time yeah. where you have some space and some room for you to be with them and for the individual to be. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we are able as, as, a, as a good person, as a good human being on this planet, to keep it very light and connected and mm -hmm. curious. And that might be broaching a conversation along the lines of, you know, I've, I've, not, I've noticed in the last few days that you've been, that you've been more tired or that you've, that you've seemed really irritable where, where before perhaps you'd have been able to laugh something off and I wanted to check in with you to see how you are so it stays quite there's no judgment there's no I know what's going on it's just going I've just noticed I just get a sense that I just I just want to know how you are I'm always amazed at the number of times I ask someone how they are and because there is an intention of actually giving a shit because I really want to know the answer that how within minutes they'll either be sobbing or telling me stuff that they weren't expecting and I wasn't expecting. Yeah. So I, I think just that, just that being present and asking the question because we really want the person to have some room to speak um, is, is real breakthrough time. Let the other person lead the discussion. Y you may be the first person that they've told. You may be the very first person outside of themselves that they have expressed what is going on in their life. So make some room for them yeah. and let them be the ones that guide the conversation. Listen to them and see them. And that means listening very, very carefully that we show our listening. And, and, if, and we, we, if we look at Carl Rogers work in um, person-centered counseling uh, and about how we remain relational, he talks about how we, how we, we respond to them and we acknowledge what they've said by repeating back to them. And that shows our, our ability to listen. We repeat back in the way that they've said it when they say they're really pissed off and we're able to go, I say you're really pissed off. We're able to replay and, and in that moment, that person is visible, is seen, is right at the very heart of the conversation. There's no fixing, there's no solution offering, keeping questions to a minimum and what we're doing is we're making some room for the other. We are making a container that says, you can be, you can talk, you can sob, you can tell me everything, you can tell me nothing. Um, we might, towards the end of that conversation, want to 
talk about some options for them when, once we have a sense of what's going on about, you know, have you spoken to a, a GP? Is this maybe if we manage them, this might be about, do you need some, do you need some time out of work? Do we need to just think about how we help you manage your day? Is there, perhaps there's some suggestions around, you know, m m you used to exercise a lot, might just getting out for a walk and having some fresh air in nature. So real light touch around where does this go from here? and know your limits it's unlikely that you're a therapist whoever whoever is watching this it might be and, and if you are then it, then perhaps you will go into it differently but most most of us aren't and therefore we don't need to assume that role this is not about assuming the role of uh, a therapist uh, a guide a leading them towards something we just need to help them by being with them and perhaps we start to just point some very light signposts um, if we have a sense of there is something much more serious and crisis point at the edge going on then we also need to be able to help them figure out where they do go whether that's Samaritans or whether that's an advice line or whether that's calling a crisis team so that might also be the reality we don't have to have that information yeah. to our fingertips but we do need to be able to know that we can go and find it fantastic um you've talked to um mental hygienist richard tyler today about uh, mental health crisis if you're watching and you're finding this uh, really useful and helpful please do give us a thumbs up because it really does help the channel richard um as you're talking there hearing you talk about time and space and, and giving people the room to um to discuss really where, where their challenges are just from personal experience i can really relate to what you're saying um both um i've had this happen to me in a, in a work scenario and also in family as well where you see something isn't quite right and you want to help but you actually don't really have the time right now to ask the questions um and i have made that mistake of opening up the conversation um at a time where there wasn't really time to to deal with it so i really get what you're saying in terms of make sure when you open this up that you have got time to sit with someone and be with them and hear what they're they're saying i think that's so important let's talk about covid because i think it's still the elephant in the room 46 percent of um people say that their mental wellness is worse now than before covid and I think it just shows how close to the wind um, so many of us have been sort of sailing up to this point. What kind of things have you sort of seen? What kind of things as therapists are you sort of dealing with? Uh, what kind of challenges are people suffering with right now? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, you don't need to look far to find research and data. Center for Mental Health is telling us some very uh, frightening hmm. statistics for an additional 10 million people will need be needing support for their mental health over the coming 18 months. Mm. Uh, those, those might be people that have already been treated for a mental health condition and it has worsened or people that really are presenting with something for the very first time. So, um, you know, this is, it's shaken uh, many people's worlds. And, and if I think about what I'm, I mean, I'm seeing and feeling and hearing lots and if the, if there were some threads coming out of it, there is such an enormous um, grieving process that we are, some of us are in, and some are kind of knowing that they need to enter into, or knowing at some point that they will need to acknowledge the, the loss, what we have lost, which is not just the, for some people, sadly, the physical loss of a loved one or a, a family friend. Mm but loved a, a loss of some of the other things which are um, uh, some of our emotional attachments, some of our conditions that we've lived in before, some of our freedoms, some of our what we perceive to be our rights, our rules, our normalities, just being able to go to the theatre or to go to the pub or to pop around and see the neighbour. Um, people losing jobs, people losing incomes, people losing their homes. So the, the loss is, in, is enormous and I think what that shows us is that for a long time we have been very identified with our worlds being a certain way and and in some ways we can say taking for granted how it was taking for granted what was normal what was predictable what would always be there when we wake up and now we're finding that that, that 
much of that has been torn away yeah. and and that's incredibly hard for people i i sometimes consider myself to be fortunate coming from a background of music and theater where we were taught a lot about um the requirement for being able to improvise being able to work with what is in the room in the moment that's true for me as a therapist it was true for me as a musician and that's what many of us are needing to experience we're having to work in this space that is quite improvised. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, we don't know what's around the corner. We don't know that just because we go to bed tonight at our normal time, that when we wake up tomorrow, it's all going to be as it was the day before. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, that got worse for us with the changes to um, the rules, changes to the tiers that we're in. You're in a tier, you're not in a tier. You can go to the theatre, you can't go to the theatre. And lack of clarity. So people are desperately seeking some clarity, something solid outside of themselves. And yeah. for me, that's what's been a, a, an overwhelming insight this year is the reminder that we so, we so often look outside of ourselves for answers, for reassurance, for someone to fix it, for that person in government or that person at our doctor's surgery to make it better for us. And what this is alerting us all to is something around how are we taking greater responsibility internally mm. with what we control and what we look after our own health our and that's our psychological health as well as our uh, physical health about taking care of our own emotions about becoming more conscious to uh, manage our feelings and our reactions and our responses to what is happening around us and in a world that is massively addicted to speed and pace and a sense of doing and being more um, that actually there is a big ask for us to go about life with a bit more gentleness mm. and a bit more attention and awareness and yeah. and understanding of what is a noticing of what is happening around us I, it was so it was a really moving moment at the beginning of the first lockdown where I would go to the supermarket and I was just very aware of people were driving differently on the roads. They were driving, more people would let you out, even though there were less cars, people would let you out. It was a very, the first few times of being in the supermarket, people having a very different awareness of who was around them and who might need help and who actually might need that last bag of pasta as we're going to fight over it, or who might need the last packet of loo rolls more. Whilst there were some that go, fuck it, I'm having the loo rolls. There were others that were just very um, present and aware of the need of others as well as the need of themselves yeah. and that was really moving to see I was yeah. like wow this is this is educating us in a, you know something that is our planet is begging for us to pay attention in a different yeah. way for how we service ourselves and how we serve those around us um and of course much of that drops off yeah i've got to we, say we've, a couple of things as well richard in, in this and in that you know you You've got people who um, seem to be sort of caring more, um, taking more time, being there for for other people in in the way that you describe. And it's, I think, really, I suppose, thinking of this, a couple of things is there's the responsibility that we need to take for ourselves as an individual, and there's also the care that we can take of other people as well, the compassion that we can have um, for them as well. Um, I want to ask you, as we we're talking here today, that we've talked about um, mental health crisis, but we've also covered mental health in a few of the videos. And I want to make sure that what we do is link to those videos um, for you so that you can click through and have a look at those as well. Um, Richard, I want to finish off with you today, just talking about um, a challenge, something that we've talked about today that could help people make this really practical, something that they can take away with them. What would, uh, what would your challenge be? Okay, so um, certainly I know I'm guilty of often saying, oh, I wonder how Jane is. I talked about Jane the other day. I wonder how she's doing. I haven't heard from Jane for a while. Yeah, I must ring Jane at some point and check in with her. And I don't, I don't check in with Jane. And then a few weeks later, I go, oh, I must check in with Jane. I wonder, I thought about Jane. How weird that I thought about Jane, but I yeah. haven't seen anything from her. So my encouragement and my challenge would be to look through your contacts and spot the names in your contact list of people you go, oh yeah, I, I often think about, I must check in with them. I haven't seen them on Facebook and I haven't texted them and they haven't called me. They normally send me a Christmas card, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. I often wonder how they are. And 
then make contact with them. Yeah. Don't wait, just one person and make contact with them and check in with them. And whether that is a text message or whether that's a phone call, check in, build some human connection. We are, we need, we need to start repairing this structure of connection. And that's one of the ways in which we can really easily do it. Fantastic. Love that, Richard. Thank you for your time today. Really do appreciate it. Pleasure always. Richard talked about how um, a crisis would often start small. And I mentioned how, from what he said, it, I could see it as being quite fluid and then maybe becoming more dense over time. He also talked about the importance of approaching people who we can see as struggling and making sure that if we do that, that we do that in a way that gives them the time and space that they need. I love the challenges that each of our wellness experts leave us at the end of these videos because they give us an opportunity to try something new, um, which is a great way to learn. But also, if we're trying something new to solve a problem for ourselves and it doesn't work, well, chuck the idea out and find something that does. I'm going to be trying Richard's challenge. I hope you will too. You can see my findings from this challenge in our challenge roundup video, which is a monthly summary covering all of the challenges our experts have shared. To get that video and all of our latest health and wellness uploads, including interviews and reviews, subscribe and hit the bell so you get notified whenever we post. And if this channel can help your friends and family, please share it with them too. If you want to get proactive with your health, Total Wellness Club are developing health quests over at questly.life. Join while we're developing the site and get access to health quests that immediately personalize your health. You'll get to identify which of 10 critical health categories need your attention. You'll be able to track your progress and you'll be able to help us develop the platform too. I'll put a link in the description and I'll see you in the next video.